what might explain a killer like him? Ted Bundy may have been a psychopath, a personality disorder in modern psychology, and a controversial theory that may explain criminal tendencies. It is estimated that one in every 100 people is a psychopath. Who exactly is a psychopath? There is a checklist of traits. Psychopaths are charming, like Bundy, who lures young women by wearing a fake cast and asking for help. I'm not afraid of him. He just doesn't look like the type to kill somebody. Psychopaths have a way with words and can manipulate and con people easily. Surprised? I don't know. I didn't know what to expect. I've never been in jail before. I've never been arrested before. In Bundy's case, he even chose to serve as his own attorney. He kills at least 30 victims across the country between 1974 and 1978. Psychopaths are egocentric, like cult leader Jim Jones, who in 1977 takes 900 followers to Jonestown, Guyana in South America. One year later, he directs them all to commit mass suicide by drinking poisoned Kool-Aid. And psychopaths are grandiose, like Ian Brady, who feels he is entitled to rape and murder. He slaughters five children with the help of his accomplice, Myra Hendley then picnics over the shallow graves of their victims. And perhaps most importantly, psychopaths by definition are callous. One of the most extreme examples of a psychopath, the killer known as BTK. BTK begins his killing spree in 1974 by brutally murdering a family in their Wichita home. I had never strangled anyone before, so I really didn't know how much pressure you had to put on a person or how long it would take. The killer taunts the local media with a letter, giving himself the name of BTK, Bind, Torture, Kill. Between 1974 and 1991, the BTK killer systematically stalks, tortures, and murders 10 people in his own community. I have many projects there were different people in the town that I followed, watched. The BTK killer, Ted Bundy, and Ian Brady do not seem to fit into the theory of Dr. Pincus. None was reportedly abused or was diagnosed with mental illness or brain damage. Yet they are responsible for the death of dozens of victims. What lies beneath their callous nature? For decades, researchers have studied the behavior of psychopaths. But with new imaging technology, scientists are now discovering that psychopaths may actually be wired differently than the rest of us. Psychopaths can do amazingly bad things. They're very cold-blooded. Dr. Kent Keel, Yale University. What we're looking for in the psychopath is to try to understand whether or not the emotional circuits of the brain are processing information efficiently. Dr. Keel compares psychopaths to non-psychopaths. He hooks subjects up to an EEG. Your brain acts like millions of little batteries. And when those batteries are all organized, we can record what your brain is doing while you're processing different types of information. He flashes subjects emotional words on a monitor. Positive words like love, friend, and negative words, hurt, maim, kill. Dr. Keel looks at their brain waves to see their reaction to these words, to probe when they experience emotion. He uses a functional MRI to see where emotions are being processed in the brain. And what we find is that psychopaths don't tend to process emotional information like the rest of us do. Keel discovers that in the mind of a psychopath, their emotional response is less active. Psychopaths, if they're emotionally devoid of these feelings, then they're not going to hesitate when it comes to acting violently. They're disinhibited. The stop signals that most of us learn to appreciate and inhibit, psychopaths don't have those same stop signals. They don't tend to process them in the same way. An extreme psychopath, like the BTK killer, is emotionally detached. This became terrifyingly clear in 2005. Got our glass of water. 
comforted her a little bit, and then I went ahead and tied her up, and then uh, put a bag, a bag over her head and strangled her. After three decades of taunting police, the serial killer who methodically tortures and kills is finally caught. Dennis Rader is a married, middle-class, church-going man. We went to trial. I think it would be just a long, drawn to a guilty, just a long process. So, you know, it's just a mathematical problem. It's guilty. Even in court, BTK continues to horrify his community. Potential hits that, in my world, that's what I call them. So you call projects, hits. He shares details of each murder. It is not only the brutality of the crimes, but the cold, unemotional demeanor that shocked the nation. I had a lot of them, so it's just, if one didn't work out, I just moved to another one. What in the minds of serial killers like BTK allows them to kill again and again? Why don't they stop? The answer may be fear. At the University of Southern California, Scientists Michelle Fung and Dr. Adrian Rain also study psychopaths. When you think about a really heinous crime, your immediate thought might be, how could anyone do that to someone else? Their research may offer insights as to why psychopaths, criminals as extreme as BTK, are able to commit crimes again and again. They focus on the absence of one particular emotion, fear. Electrodes are placed on the subject's skin to measure heart rate and sweat rates. Once subjects are wired, the challenge for Fung is to create an anxious situation. For most people, fear is triggered by not knowing what to expect. Headphones are placed on the subjects. A monitor is rolled in, which will serve as a timer. Starting from 12 seconds, the numbers will count down to zero. Meanwhile, researchers watch the subject's heart and sweat rates. Subjects are told that when the countdown ends, they will hear a jarring blast of white noise, like a loud scrape on a chalkboard. They find an interesting result. Most people sweat. Psychopaths don't which may be a clue. Psychopaths may not be as inhibited from committing crimes. If you can think about this result that we find, it makes more sense. It's not necessarily an excuse for behavior, but it's sort of an explanation of how that is possible. Dr. Adrian Rain conducts a similar experiment, but instead of a blast, subjects wait to endure a stressful task. They are abruptly told they will have to prepare a two-minute speech about the worst thing they have ever done. Once again, he monitors heart and sweat rates. He reaches the same result. Psychopaths are not afraid. They lack that biological wiring that would normally give them anticipatory fear. Psychopaths are literally cold-blooded. Leaving an intriguing implication, psychopaths may naturally be fearless. This fearlessness may allow a psychopath like the BTK killer to remain calm, blind to the emotions of others, and perhaps capable of murdering again and again. Dr. Rain has taken the research a step further. Not only has he scanned the brains of psychopaths, he has looked into the minds of murderers. They're literally wired differently to the rest of us. Researchers from across the country are embarking on an important journey. What is evil? Evil is made up of a number of factors, but can anyone be more evil than someone who takes someone else's life? Somebody who rapes another individual? That's evil. They are exploring the factors that may lead to extreme violence, to acts considered most evil. Their work has looked at subjects who show vulnerabilities to criminal behavior people who may become violent. But in one study, Dr. Rain takes a drastically different approach. Instead of looking at potential killers, he scans the brains of convicted killers. 
quite surprisingly, there'd never been a functional imaging study on murderers, comparing them to normal controls to see if their brains did truly differ. Is the mind of a killer different from our own? 41 convicted murderers are taken from prison to Dr. Rain's lab. The prisoner was escorted into the PET scanner, released from the shackles and chains, and took part in the imaging experiment. The subject comes in and we inject them with a radioactive isotope. This isotope attaches itself to glucose in the blood. The brain uses glucose for its fuel. So wherever the glucose goes in the brain, so does the radioactive isotope. The brain of each murderer is scanned. The radioactive isotope is a tracer, allowing Dr. Rain to unravel the path of a killer's thoughts he finds an intriguing result. A killer's brain appears distinct. As a group, they show reduced activity in their prefrontal cortex. This is the area that controls aggression and impulse. If I get angry with you and you irritate and annoy me, part of me gets angry and I want to take a knife and stick it into your heart. What stops me doing that? The prefrontal cortex. It's the guardian angel on behavior. It tells us, wait, stop here, don't pick up the knife, not in this situation, not at this time, wrong way. Dr. Rain is actually able to point out the difference between a normal brain and a killer's brain. He can even show the distinct brain of a serial killer. Not all murderers are the same, of course. Here we have an individual who killed 64 people in a 12-year period without getting caught. A serial killer had a different brain scan to the normal control and to the single impulsive murderer. What's the difference between serial killers and one-off killers? It may well be frontal activation. Good frontal activation may mean that you don't get caught, that you're much more aware of your surroundings, you're aware of the cues that predict punishment, meaning that the police are on your trail. But the comparison is not so simple. Here we have another individual here who looks like they have the brain scan of the serial killer. What's interesting about this brain scan is that it's my brain scan. And the point to make here is that brain imaging is not diagnostic. There are clearly some normal people like myself with abnormal brain scans. And conversely, there are abnormal individuals, killers, who have normal brain scans. Violence and homicide is very complex. There's lots of pieces. While it is unlikely we will ever be able to predict violent crime without a shadow of doubt, as we peer into the minds of serial killers, startling new insights do emerge. From uncovering the damaged mind and tortured childhood of Arthur Shawcross and Gary Heidnick, to understanding the psychopathic tendencies of Ted Bundy and Dennis Rader, the pieces of the puzzle are beginning to take shape. The psychopath is like a complex jigsaw puzzle.